Hello, hello. Uh, we're starting. Yay. We're starting a few minutes late here, folks, and we're actually going to get started started in just a few moments. Um, today, I am so excited. We have New York Times bestselling author Michelle Richmond with us today. Um, her workshop, Novel in Five, is, is really what we're all here to watch and to learn from. Uh, but before we get started in a few moments, uh, I know that there's some folks already in the chat. What we would love for people to do is, if you're watching us live, you know, let us know you could see us, you could hear us. We want to make sure everything works technically before we, we kick it over to Michelle. So if you're in the chat today, you know, just uh, let me know you could see us, let me know you could hear us, and let me know where you're writing in from. Um, you know, th those are the things we'd love to see. Obviously, I'm in Brooklyn today. Um, and we'll get started in just a few moments. And Michelle, while we wait for folks to trickle in, let's uh, make sure all your audio sounds good because I see folks starting to come in. Okie doke. Hi, Aaron. It's great to see you. It's great to see you as well. And you sound loud and clear. And I'm, yeah. I'm seeing comments to come in. Um, I, it, it actually takes me and Michelle about 20 seconds to see your comments, folks, because there's a slight delay. So thank you. Thank you so much for writing in. I'm seeing the comments trickle in now. Um, we have folks from the, on the Washington coast. Uh, we got Bend, Oregon. We got Tennessee, Boulder, Colorado. Very, very cool. All uh, the pretty places in the country are represented. <laughs> just all of them. Yeah. Um, I'm actually in Brooklyn. We're waiting on a snowstorm right now. So by the time this workshop is over and I learn how to write my novel in five months, um, mm -hmm. it should be a winter wonderland right behind me. Yeah. So that should be very cool. Well, you, you'll have to you move your screen over and show us the um, snow coming down. I haven't seen that in a very long time. Yeah, no, we're waiting on it right now. Uh, and for those joining us today, right, if you join us a bit late, a few technical housekeeping things before I hand it over to Michelle. If you join us late and you're worried about seeing a replay, don't worry. This is a, this. There will be a replay available for this workshop. If you join late and you want to start from the beginning, go ahead. Um, you know, this is going to be up on the Teachable site. This will be up on YouTube for a while. Uh, there's, there's, there will always be a replay for this workshop. Um, additionally, if you're joining today because you have some very specific questions for Michelle, there will be time for Q and A at the end. Um, you know, typically how these workshops work is. 30 to 45 minutes worth of content, and then we open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions, if there's any topics you want Michelle to cover today, you know, please put them in the chat. We'll, if there's anything urgent, obviously, if you, if you can't see or you can't hear us anymore, let us know that immediately. But if there's any uh, questions or topics you want Michelle to cover, let us know. You know we'll, we'll try to grab those towards the end of the workshop. Uh, with that, Michelle, so excited to have you here today. Um, you know, the my understanding is in this workshop, you're going to cover how to take a novel from an idea to a finished draft, uh, or at least touch upon it. You're going to talk through how to get past barriers that keep you from start as, starting and finishing a novel. Um, and you're going to teach us how to learn how much we can do with just 4,000 uh, words per week. Uh, yeah. These are incredible, incredible things. I'm really excited. Again, Michelle, we thank you for being here and uh, for you to go through your workshop of how to write a novel in five months. For those who perhaps don't know you, and this is their first time uh, seeing you today, I kick it to you. Let's give us a bit about your background and whenever you want, I'll share my screen with your presentation and we'll go Great. through it. Thank you so much for having me, Aaron, and uh, to all of those of you who are here, welcome. I'm excited to talk to you today about my favorite subject, which is writing novels. So the first thing I, I wanna let you know is that you're in good hands because um, writing a novel takes time. It doesn't happen overnight and you might sort of do a fast draft in 30 days, but to really write a novel, it takes time, contemplation, and it also takes an education and craft. So I want to let you know you're in good hands. I don't just teach writing, I am a working writer. I've published um, six novels uh, with um, Random House and Grove Atlantic and two story collections. And I um, have, my books have been published in 30 languages. They've been option for the big screen and TV. And I've also been teaching for a long time. So I've taught in the Masters of Fine Arts programs in creative writing at the University of San Francisco, California College of the Arts, St. Mary's College of Moraga, Bowling Green State University and elsewhere. And I've also designed and taught novel writing classes for Stanford continuing studies, so online novel writing classes. So I'm very comfortable um, teaching online and I especially found it um, during the last year to be um, a great way to connect and stay connected. So that's sort of my background in a nutshell. I um, mean, Aaron, if you, um, if once Aaron goes through the slides a little bit, you'll notice that um, 
I've also, my books have been reviewed in the New York Times and Boston Globe and Washington Post and um, all of the places you want your books to get reviewed. And I only mention that because I want you to know that you're not learning just from someone who kind of talks about writing. It's really um, a long-term life uh, decision for me and a career. And so that's what I bring to you when I, when I talk to you about about writing your novel. Incredible. And, and we had a bit of technical difficulties on our side today. So I'll be actually click, Michelle's going to let me know when to click through her parts of her presentation. Yeah. Whenever you'd like, Michelle, I can bring that uh, up. Yeah. Can you start? Um, yeah. So, oh, uh, the next one, you're in the right place. So this, this class is for you if you've always wanted to write a novel, but you don't know where to begin. I get a lot of emails from aspiring writers who say, um, they have a great idea, but they just don't know where to start. I also hear from writers who have an unfinished novel or two or even three stuck in a drawer, or the novel is stuck in your head. This is also a great class for you if you find yourself, you have all the inspiration at the beginning for writing, but then you kind of write yourself into a corner or you get bogged down in the middle of the novel, which happens a lot. The middle distance is one of the hardest places to keep up the momentum, or you just sort of lose steam after chapter three or four or somewhere in the middle. Um, you're also in the right place if you have a great idea or even just what might be a good idea, but you need accountability and guidance to turn it into your book into it. And it's also if you, you know, maybe you've thought about writing a novel for 10 years and January 1st, you always write down, this is the year I write my novel. Well, I want to change that. I want, you know, it's 2021 people. This really should be the year you write your novel. You know, we, I mean, if we've learned um, one thing this year, it's that uh, our expectations can be completely exploded. We don't know what's coming the, in the following months. So if you want to commit to actually getting your novel on the page this year, you're in the right place. Um, and then we'll just move to the next one. Um, these are just uh, letting you know that um, I've been doing this for a while. So those are some of my books. Um, the next slide, uh, Aaron. Uh, uh, just more stuff about, uh, and I've published articles and essays on writing in the Writer's Chronicle, Writer's Digest, and I have articles and essays in all these other places too. So you can, that's on, that's just, you guys don't need to know too much about that. And that's where I've taught. You just need to know that I've done that stuff. So I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're going to talk about getting up the tree. You might wonder what what on earth does that mean? We're going to talk about what you need and don't need to begin a novel. You might be surprised what you don't actually need to begin a novel. We're going to talk about how to know if your idea is actually even worth turning into a novel, because that's definitely something you need to consider before you sit down and spend many, many hours of your life writing a novel, you need to really put some thought into whether your idea is what I say called novel worthy. And I'm going to talk about eight steps to get you started. And finally, one more thing that you actually don't need yet to start your novel. So we'll go on to the next screen. Thank you, Erin. Um, th and thank you so much to you for doing this screen share for me. Um, as Erin mentioned, we had some technical difficulties. They were entirely on my end with my screen share. So I appreciate you doing this for me. So um, this is one of my favorite quotes I'm writing. This is from Nabokov. And you think of Nabokov as this master stylist, which he was, and you might even think of him as sort of this stuffy character, which he wasn't entirely. But he said that writer's job is to get the main character up a tree, and then once they are up there, throw rocks at them. Now, of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but really, if you can keep this in your mind, you have to get your character up the tree, and you have to throw some rocks at them. Life cannot be easy for your main character. So um, if everything's easy breezy, if um, they have a great job, great marriage, nice house, um, and no internal turmoil whatsoever, um, it's not a story. So take someone you like or someone you don't like, it doesn't matter, put them up a tree and start throwing rocks at them. 
Of course, you have to do a lot more than that, but if you keep that in your head, then you are off to a good start. So we'll go on to the next slide. So it may surprise you to know that I never begin a novel with plot, and you can take this advice from um, someone much, uh, much better known than me and probably smarter than me, um, Stephen King, who also says he never begins with plot, he begins with situation. So this quote here is from v Vivian Gornick, who wrote a brilliant book called The Situation and the Story. Her book is actually about memoir, but the, what you're learning in this class applies to long form narrative, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So for a novel or for a memoir. Um, but uh, Gornick writes, every work of literature has both a situation and a story. The situation is the context or circumstance, sometimes the plot. The story is the emotional experience that preoccupies the writer, the insight, the wisdom, the thing one has come to say. And I love this, the thing one has come to say. So as you're writing your novel, you're going to think about what you have come to say, but you don't necessarily need to know that at the beginning. What you need to know at the beginning is your situation. What is where your novel takes place? Who is at the center of it? And what sort of problem they're in? So Stephen King also says he never thinks of a plot when he starts. He thinks what situation is his character in and can that situation be complicated? And um, his book is on writing, A Memoir of the Craft. It's brilliant. I recommend it to anyone, whether you're, you don't have to be writing suspense fiction to get a lot out of that book. Um, it's really, it's useful advice for, and useful and completely non It's even something I've read in my role, J just to share, like that's a book that was impactful on me, even in what I do. So like, oh, yeah, what? anytime you've written, communic oh yeah, for any form of written communication, Stephen King on writing. So you're speaking oh, to my heart. So, right that's now. good. That's really good to hear because he's so Stephen King's advice is so practical, right? And it's also, I mean, this and one thing that he writes about that um, that I love. He writes a lot about craft, but he also writes about um, just sort of writing when the situation is terrible, when he's freezing and broke, and um, and. Uh, and when it seems like the world is falling apart, he was still writing. So I think that's another great um, information to take from that book. And um, in my in my classes, I always share a lot of recommended reading. I share the books that have inspired me, the writers that have inspired me, and um, and the advice that I've gleaned from teachers over the years. Because nobody just sort of hits the ground running with a novel and knows what to do. There's a lot of knowledge that you um, build on uh, to make the novel really sing and to show the emotional experience that you want to bring to the reader. So we'll go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So first let's talk about what makes a situation novel worthy. Um, so first of all, it has to be risky enough that readers will care. Um, I remember, um, I did not take this picture, but I have a picture just like this from years ago. I was doing a literary event on the Gulf Coast and I was staying in a, um, like this nice condo on the beach, but you had to walk across this little bridge to get to the little, um, the little uh, resort store, you know, or, and restaurants. And there were these signs all over this little bridge that look just like this about these alligators. <laughs> and I thought, what? I thought this is the beach, but they had, you know, sort of these alligators just sort of wandering. So um, your novel, there has to be something at risk and that risk has to be clear, if not in the first paragraph, although that's good, certainly in the first couple of pages. So um, I'll just give you an example from years ago, many years ago, I had two books out that nobody had read and I was writing a new novel and I decided, you know, I want something different this time. You know, it's nice to do readings. It's nice to get reviews, but I want readers to find my book in the bookstore and read it. And so I thought, you know, what is missing in these other books? And I thought maybe there's just not enough at stake. So I wrote a book that begins 
um, in the first page, uh, a child goes missing on Ocean Beach in San Francisco in the fog. And if any of you know San Francisco, especially San Francisco 15 years ago, not as much now because we have less fog now, but you can go to Ocean Beach and not be able to see, you know, 15 feet in front of you. So a child goes, uh, sort of disappears into the fog on Ocean Beach. And uh, and I knew when I wrote that, okay, that's risk because then everybody wants to know, oh my God, what happened to the kid? Where's the kid? Are you going to find the kid? And that sustains an entire book. And lo and behold, that was my breakout book. And I know that um, I was doing the same kind of writing I had always done. I didn't, you know, I, I got to keep doing the sentences I wanted to write and thinking sort of in a literary way, but there was a huge risk with the child going missing on the front page. So you always think about the risk. Your situation has to be complex enough to drive the narrative for a long time because your novel is going to be, like a typical novel length is about 70,000 words. Um, often a contract will stipulate, and my contracts generally have, with Random House stipulated a novel of about 100,000 words, but they could come in a little below or a little more than that, but 70, 80,000 range is a good novel length, which is about 250 to 350 pages, give or take. Um, so you're, the story you're trying to tell has to have embedded complexity um, so, that, so that you will have enough things that you can keep peppering throughout it. Um, peppering is not actually the right word. Things that you can keep weaving throughout it and echoes that you can create that will have this complexity to keep it going for um, the long haul. And then finally, it has to be interesting enough to you as the writer to keep you going through the long haul because I promise you, the moment you get bored with your story, you're, you are losing your readers. If you get bored, they're going to get bored. So you have to find a subject that is fascinating to you in some way. And it also helps, of course, if you take, if you have sort of a newish take on a universal theme. So my last book was called Marriage Pact and this book about marriage. There's nothing more universal well, possibly than marriage other than, um, you know, death. I mean, it, because marriage goes across all cultures, but in the marriage pact, there's a sort of a cult, a cult organization for marriages that promises to help um, couples keep their marriages intact. So it's, it's not that a million people haven't written about marriage. They have. Um, um, you know, millions of people have written about marriage going wrong, but it was a new twist of sort of this marriage cult that was uh, told in a different way. And so it happened to um, reach a lot of, uh, you know, uh, send off those signals in publishers' brains. Yes, this, this is a concept. This is a book that we can sell. So you want to uh, think about what is something that many people experience or consider and then how can you give it you're not going to make it totally new but how can you give it a newish spin okay so now you know how to think about whether or not your situation is novel worthy so let's go on to the next slide please let's see oh okay so here we're going to talk about eight essential steps to writing your novel so um when you know when people tell me that they just don't know how to start I think a lot of times it's because they think they need something that they don't need to start a novel. They think they have to have it planned out in their head, which you don't. And they think they have to have an outline, which you don't. <laughs> so if you're thinking, well, once I write my not once I write my outline, I'll write my novel. I want you to get that out of your head. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no place for planning. And outlines actually work really well for some writers, but you don't have to have it before you start. And in my classes, I teach a couple of variations on it. I teach um, outlining if you want to but I'm far more interested in scene lists and story charts, which I think are actually a lot more helpful than, um, 
been an outline for a lot of writers. So now that you know that you can start without an outline, that outline cannot be your excuse anymore. <laughs> um, let's talk about what you do need to know. So we'll move on to the next slide. So we're just going to go through eight things that you have to have in your mind as you start your novel. So first, you're going to have to identify your protagonist. This is the who. Who is at the center of your story? Whom should the reader care about? And this is key, this why question. This is the big question. Why should the reader care about your um, character, your protagonist? Then you want to know what drives the character to do what they do, because one of the um, biggest sort of beat skips that you get, you notice that this when you're reading a book and you notice it when you're watching a movie, if a character does something like a character can do something illogical at any moment, that's fine. But you have to know why the reader has no why the character is making these decisions, what motivates them. And it, it's okay that it's not something you would do, but we have to know, we have to know why that character is doing it. Um, make sure that your character is capable of being active, not just acted upon. And this is another place where a lot of um, novels fall. So if you have a protagonist who is, I mean, pr protagonists will have weaknesses and flaws. I think I just said protagonists, <laughs> but <laughs> protagonists will have weaknesses and flaws. They will have things they can't do. That's what makes them interesting. But if they are passive, um, they will probably be boring. Um, and there's a possibility that you'll have some degree of passivity um, and they will overcome that and that's part of their arc. But we need to see a character taking action. That doesn't mean that when you start, you have to know what actions your character is going to take. You don't need to know that yet. But it has, as you go through your novel, you have to clearly have your protagonist um, acting, doing things. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of people write their first novel sort of based on themselves a little bit, and that is totally okay. Maybe your second, third, and fourth novels are based on yourself. That's okay too. But what is not okay is if you direct your um, protagonist as though you're directing your own life. Um, you have to let your protagonist make really bad decisions you would never make. And you have to put them in horrible situations you would never want to find yourself in. So even if um, the character is based on sort of some composite of people you know, or um, has a little bit of you in him or in her, you need to make sure that you divorce that character from yourself so you can treat, treat them in a fictional way and let them get into it all sorts of messes because you know you're not going to throw that rock those rocks <laughs> at your character up the tree if you're um too if you're too sort of enamored with them as some sort of uh version of yourself uh and then so number two okay so you know who your character is but then you have to choose your point of view who is telling your story and from what distance. And the distance is important. This is a more complex matter of point of view that we get into in um, the class, but who is telling the story? So are you gonna have um, a first person narrator who is at the center of the story? Are you going to have, you might have a first person narrator who's on the periphery like Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby. You might have an omniscient narration um, that can see all and hear all, like in Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides, which, by the way, is a brilliant do not try this at home book. <laughs> it's, I still can't quite unravel that book in my mind. Haruki Murakami does these strange points of view beautifully, too. Um, you can have third person limited, which is, you know, a person um, a seeing through the eyes of one character, but in the third person. So you're not speaking as an I, but as a he, she, they. Um, but the narration is still limited to what that person can see, hear, perceive. Um, and point of view is important because it, and it's important to know at the beginning because it's sort of this umbrella 
over the entire telling of your book, what can be said, what can't be said. I prefer writing in first person because it comes more naturally to me and it's so intimate. Like, oh, you want to establish intimacy between your um, reader and your protagonist, um, a first person from your protagonist's point of view is super intimate, but then you have to think about how information is going to come into the book that the protagonist doesn't have in his mind. And of course, dialogue is one way you do this. Um, there's a lot of complexity to dialogue. I, we're not going to go into that today. I would highly recommend that you read Grace Paley, um, who's brilliant at dialogue. And Erin, you're in New York, you're in Brooklyn. She's like the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn voice. I mean, Grace Paley, this is what she's known for. Um, her character, the way her characters speak is um, sort of staccato. It is, her, she, she's one of, I think the most um, distinctive writers, distinctive writer voices that you can hear as you're reading. Like you pick up a Grace Paley story, you know it's hers. Um, her, her stories are lyrical, but her characters do not speak lyrically. They speak with this sort of directness that's just amazing. So read Grace Paley for dialogue. But um, so again, your point of view will then encompass all of these other decisions that you make in your novel. So you got your protagonist, your point of view. Let's go to um, next, establish the setting. And actually, this is where... I think a lot of beginning writers are most comfortable because this is descriptive writing. And you don't, when you first start out establishing your setting, you don't have to think a lot about plot or who's doing what you can. This is a great way to enter a story. And in fact, for me, I know the setting of a novel, the moment, I mean, I understand the setting before I even know the character. Um, my new book that's coming out in the summer is set in Silicon Valley because that's where I live. But I wrote several books set in San Francisco because that was where I was living when I was writing those books. And San Francisco was just sort of a character in my head. So it always sort of naturally established itself as the setting of my books. So you think where and when does your novel take place? The when is also important. Is it uh, modern day, historical, 70s, um, whatever your future. Um, so you need to know where it takes place and when it takes place. And one thing I really highly recommend is just think about what location is your muse and what is the place of your original wanderings. So I don't actually write about Alabama a lot now, but I did in my first few books because yes, that is my original wanderings, y'all. I grew up in Alabama. I spent 18 years of my life there. And so my first books had um, the Gulf Coast and and uh, this sort of totally, um, this part of the South that people don't talk about, which is just sort of the boring suburban South, <laughs> which was the South that I knew. Um, so where, what place do you know so intimately you can describe it like no one else? And this may be, a place you grew up, it may be a place you have made your home, it may be a place that you travel to often. Um, and so there are writers that you that are intimately associated with the place that they write about, like Richard Yates in upstate New York, um, Sher Sherwood Anderson in Winesburg, Ohio, um, and Rick Bass, Montana. So think about what place inspires you and what what is this? so like when I was writing the year of fog where the girl goes missing on the beach I thought well this can happen one place that I know of in the world and, and this where the fog is like that and this place is uh San Francisco so when you're thinking about the situation that you've set up where is the place that makes you think yes this is where it has to happen I think that's such a wonderful point. I appreciate you sharing it. I'm just as a reader, it's great to hear that one because I think of like Confederacy of Dunces in New Orleans, and like it's a the the setting is a character in the book. So it's like to to hear you you preaching that to a group of you know potential novelists. I'm like, wow, this is what makes books so incredibly enjoyable. Is the setting is very much an omnipresent character in the book. 
So thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah, and Aaron, so when you're reading a book where um, the set like like that, like the Confederacy of, Confederacy of Dunces, and a book where the setting is really primary to the story. Do you um, do you get like a better visual sense of the story in your head? Do you? Um... I feel I feel like it takes you there. Like yeah, it, yeah like you can picture. I feel like because uh, there's a place I knew intimately. It's like you can picture yourself in that story. It just makes it makes it very hard to put down as a reader because yeah. you're like, wow, being transported to just a different world. That's such a good point. And I mean, and you can do this. I mean, and readers can have this experience if they've never been there and they can. And, and I think that's why people, so many people love reading books about like Paris, um, whether they've been there or not. They just think about they they want that tra being transported to another place. But also, I think that's why we read books about space um where we have never been but another thing is if it's a place that is well known in um common parlance where a lot of people have been to like san francisco new york city um then people in their mind are like remembering their you know that like people will remember streets they'll remember um where that fish's eddy is or was i don't know if it's still there <laughs> um they'll remember that where you know walking by the the Zabars. And so it's really, um, you, you have a place, you give people touchstones from their own experience or touchstones from an experience they want to have. And that's super powerful. So after you've done your protagonist, your point to be your setting, what's next? Let's see. Oh, okay. Important, super important. Um, number four, consider the stakes. So what does your protagonist stand to lose or gain? Remember we talked about risks. This goes back to that. What and so what do they stand to lose or gain? And what do they want? And again, we come back to this why. Why does what they want matter? So I'll just think of um, risk. Um, if you look at um, Enduring Love by Ian McEwan. So the novel opens a guy's gone on a picnic with his i don't know if he's she's his new love or his new wife i'm not sure but anyway he's on the sort of this romantic picnic and a he sees a hot air balloon off you know sort of across the field and um there's a child in the balloon <laughs> the balloon starts lifting and the balloon breaks free of its tethers. And so this group of men from different parts of the field rush toward the hot air balloon. So immediately you're hooked, right? Why? Well, because there's a child in danger. I mean, what's more risky? There's a child in danger. So of course, all these heroic people run to the balloon to um, try to save the child. They're holding, it's very dramatically written. And there's also a film that's done really well that's all equally if not more dramatic so they're holding onto the balloon the balloon starts lifting 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 um and now as the balloon gets higher the stakes get higher because not only is this child in danger who's in the balloon but all of these people these it's three men i think at this point are holding onto the balloon have to make a decision for their own lives and i don't think this is a spoiler because it's chapter one um, our, our protagonist uh, drops off the balloon and another man drops off the balloon and the balloon keeps going up and one man keeps holding onto the balloon. And again, it's not a spoiler that one man dies. So first chapter, you have um, huge risk to lives of several characters and you have one character who dies and then um, talk about situation and story. <laughs> we have this inciting incident in this situation. And then the story is how this protagonist lives with that decision that he has made um, to let go. He survives because he let go. Um, this other man did not survive because he did not let go. The child survived. Um, and so it's, the story is then sort of this grappling with the morality of um, 
of the choice he made and who that makes him. And then there's an obsession that comes in too, which is how you layer a plot. Another character who's there becomes obsessed with him. And this creates another line of tension throughout the book, um, an external conflict in addition to the internal conflict. So stakes, always think about what your stakes are, how can you make them higher? Um, what bigger rocks can you throw at that character up the tree? Uh, and our next one, you've done all these things. Oh, this is just, um, we talk about stakes. This is a quick formula you can always remember when you're writing character plus desire equals conflict. You have a character, they want something. It can be, um, you could want this cup of coffee. Let's say, let's say you're snowed in, you don't have coffee in your house, you can't go outside, you're on lockdown, you're not allowed to go buy coffee, and you see these people on the screen have coffee. You cannot reach through the screen and get that coffee. It's a character. The stakes have never been higher. <laughs> the stakes are never higher than when you can't get your caffeine, right? So um, you have a character, they want something badly, that's conflict. So conflict doesn't have to... Uh, nobody has to fall from a hot air balloon. Um, no cars have to crash. Nobody has to die. A conflict is just your character wants something so badly and it's really hard for them to get it. That's conflict. You have internal desire, external desire, and there you have a book. Okay, so let's move on. Um, number five. Oh, I love this one. Uh, the old adage is write what you know. I say throw that out the window, write what you don't know. In some ways, you're going to write what you know. Yes, write the settings you know. You're going to write. Um, your understanding of the world will always come through in your writing, and that will be a conversation you have with a reader. But allow yourself to write what you don't know. This makes the writing more interesting to you. It adds texture and context to your book. And let's face it, you're trying to get to 70,000, 80,000 words. It helps to have something in there that is another line that you can explore. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, years ago, I think it was my third novel. So there is nothing that I am worse at than math. I'm, I mean, and, and really, it's just like a, it's difficult for my brain to grasp certain mathematical concepts, not geometry for some reason, but other ones. But so I thought, so I was writing this novel and there was a sister who had died in the novel and um, the protagonist is a coffee buyer because I love coffee. That's something I know. And it gave me something fun to research, but I had the sister who has died be a math prodigy. And this took a lot of research. Um, I ended up doing tons of research on something called Goldbox Conjecture. And it was so much fun. I ended up putting a lot of math in that book, even though math is very difficult for me. I ended up learning a lot. And it completely changed the tone, tenor, and the plot direction of the book, this math element. So I highly encourage you to find something you don't know much about, some, maybe even something that you're kind of scared of, but something that um, is interesting to you. And weave that into the book, Why, not because you just want some random crap in the book, but because when you choose a subject that you don't know a lot about and you start learning about it and weaving it into your book, you provide echoes, thematic echoes, and it creates these opportunities that you never knew that you would have um, to make the novel go in unexpected ways. And that's another reason I don't recommend writing a novel in 30 days because your novel takes time to brew and for you to figure out what these echoes are. So write what you don't know. Erin, if you're going to write what you didn't know, what, what what's something you might write about? I mean, prior to this conversation, I might write a book on writing because I, <laughs> I don't know that much. Uh, I mean, there's many, many topics, but the thing you actually just made me think of is that also applies to the nonfiction realm. I think of writers such as uh, like Mary Roach, who's not an expert on half the topics she, she mm -hmm. writes about. And like, I think she approaches those topics because she doesn't know about them. And she goes so deep into like making them interesting and unpacking them. So like, it's such a, I, I like never thought of it that way until you just walked me through it. 
But that's absolutely true about Mary Roach when you think about, I mean, and also so she has a brilliant cover designer. I'm thinking of that book with the um, toe tag Stiff. on it. It's so the, good. Yeah. The, name of the book, but it's about yeah. the death industry and the funeral industry, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess the, the thing is sort of be a, be a, be a journalist in a way, like look for things that you can learn about that you can put in your novel in a way that is not didactic, but deepens character and deepens the experience of the novel for the reader. Um, number six, uh, embrace fragments. So, um, Remember I said you don't have to have an outline? Well, you also don't have to write chronologically. Now you can, and there will certainly come a point in your book, like for me, like the first 50 pages, I'm 50 to 60 pages, I'm just generally writing forward. Um, but there will come a point in your book where you might not know what happens next. And that's okay, you can write pieces that you later put together. And usually by the time I have a draft of a novel, I have, pieces i use the floor i don't use a desk because a desk isn't big enough <laughs> i have the whole floor um, with pieces that i can then rearrange now you don't have to work that way um, and we in my class we talk about different ways that you can work but that is one way that you can sort of visualize your novel and move pieces around and how do i know that i'm not crazy and that <laughs> this works. Um, so we'll go back to Nabokov. He said, I do not begin my novel at the beginning. I do not reach chapter three before I reach chapter four. I do not go dutifully from one page to the next in consecutive order. No, I pick out a bit here and there until I have filled all the pages on paper. This is all the gaps on paper. This is why I like writing my stories and novels on index cards, numbering them later when the whole set is complete. Every card is rewritten many times. Uh, and that last sentence is about revision, remember? Uh, you, you don't get at the end where you started. Your book is different. If, if you are writing your best book, it's very different at the end from what you imagined it would be because you are always sort of revising. But um, when you write your novel, you can think about filling in gaps. So on those days when you come to the page and you have no idea what happens next, you can write a scene from your character's background or you can write a, a scene where you just sort of explore a setting. You can write um, a scene of dialogue that's one page between two characters um, that opens up their relationship in some way. So that's a good thing to remember. And this is one thing that I think really helps writers not get stuck is when you realize you don't have to write what happens next today. <laughs> you can write something else. Okay, um, our next next little piece. Um, uh, yes, yeah, set a deadline. I, I always say to my students, set a deadline, be, re be realistic, ambitious, and kind to yourself. <laughs> so realistic means you're not gonna write um, a novel probably in 60 days. You might, you might write a lot of it, you might write a draft of it, but to really um, do your best work, it's gonna take a little more time. And even with five months, so five months, the, the way I structure this, um, the five months is that you finish a really great solid first draft of your novel. But after that, you're still gonna revise. You're not sending out to agents and publishers what you finish at the end of five months because there's still revision work to do after that to make the book even better. So I say set a de deadline that's realistic, how much you can do in the time that you have that's ambitious enough that you don't get lazy, but then also set smaller goals, daily, weekly, and monthly goals. So um, you can have, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna write 750 words a day, five days a week, or, um, you know, a thousand words a day, four days a week, just however, whatever works for you and your schedule. Um, and then the next question, how long should your draft take? This really depends on you, how many words you wanna write um, per week or per month and where you can carve that time out of your schedule. But I find that if you have a deadline, it's not too far away and not too close, <laughs> somewhere in the middle, you're so much more likely to be successful 
then if you say, oh, my novel's going to be finished by the end of this month, because when it's not, you kind of feel like crap. Like, oh, once again, I didn't finish my novel. You give, your, give yourself a, um, a realistic cushion to work with. And then finally, of our eight things you need to know before you begin your novel, what was the last one? Um, oh, accountability. So I always encourage you to have somebody who knows you're writing it, who knows you're writing this book and who is paying your attention and paying attention and know it is not your mother who thinks everything you write is so good and like wants to give you a star for everything. Or maybe she doesn't, but it has to be someone um, who can give you a little bit of accountability. So as a, you know, as a, career writer, I have this accountability in a couple of roles. And the first is my literary agent who um, will send me gentle reminders that something is due or someone is waiting. And uh, the second is the publisher, because once you're an editor at a publishing house acquires your book, they have a calendar for you. And um, you have the date when you have to turn in your book, the date when you have to read your proofs, the date when you have to do your copy edits. Um, and so you know, working writers have a lot of accountability built into our lives, um, just as you do in whatever, you know, whatever field all of you are in, you have that accountability, but you might not have it in your writing. So I think it's good to have someone who can um, bring that to you. Um, let's see what's next. We'll go on to the next slide. Oh, this is, I love telling people, what do you not have to know <laughs> when you start your novel? We talk about what you have to know. You do not have to know how it will end. When I started writing The Year of Fog and the girl went missing on the beach, I was 250 pages in before I really knew if we would find the girl. No, I had an idea. But you discover a lot as you go. Um, so you don't have, like some writers do write the, first, the last chapter first and know where this book is going, but you do not have to know where it's going. And I just wanna share a little story about this photograph, if I may really quickly. Um, this picture was taken, so I just moved home from Paris after two years there and we did um, the first seven months of the pandemic in Paris and we had a really serious lockdown there. And this summer they had really gotten a tight control on the pandemic and they opened movie theaters. So we went to our favorite movie theater on the Champs-Elysees, it was totally empty. We were the only people there. We saw um, a, uh, I can't remember, it was some sort of disaster flick. I don't remember what it was, but it was such a joy to be sitting in the theater. Um, but what I find amusing about this picture is that the seats get lower as you get farther back, <laughs> which makes no sense at all. It's like reverse stadium seating anyway. So you don't have to have to know how it will end. And uh, and then I think our next sli slide is just a quick recap. Aaron, how am I doing on time? Have I been talking for too long? No, you're great. Um, and I already posted this in the chat. Just take a pause here for a second. You know, as you recap this, what I would love to is talk a bit about your your work your, beyond just this workshop, which was obviously free for anyone to attend. I would love for you to talk a little bit about your class that you have. Um, and, and before we get to that, or sorry, while while we get to that, anyone who had questions during uh, Michelle's workshop today, I already see that we have some questions here in the chat. You know, this is the time to start putting those questions in because we'll, we'll try to leave for at least 10 minutes for, for some Q&A with Michelle. Um, and I, like I said, I've already seen a few questions come in, but this is the time to drop some more in, whether that's on writing, whether it's on something Michelle covered, whether it's on her, anything in this workshop or, or her course. Um, drop the okay, questions great. in the chat. Thank you. I really look forward to answering those questions. Um, I'll do a quick recap and then I'll talk to you about um, my class if I may. So um, first, is your situation novel worthy, um, risky, complicated, interesting. Um, then you introduce your protagonist, you choose your point of view, you establish your setting, you consider the stakes, are they big enough? You write what you don't know, you embrace fra fragments because it doesn't have to be chronological. You set a deadline that's realistic, kind and ambitious, and then you add a layer of accountability. That's the recap. And we'll, um, if I may, I'll tell you a little bit about this class and how it came to be and how I think um, it could help you. Please do. Um, is there anything else you want in this presentation? Otherwise, I'll pull it off. Um, well, I, th I have some slides about the class. If you want to uh, 
do you want to pull the, it's just the next slide in the a a absolutely okay oh yeah um uh why is this particular story being told at this particular time and what is at stake? That's something you always want to keep in mind as you're writing. And, um, and then on to the next one. Okay, so here we get to the class. Um, uh, I think if you scroll down. Um, okay, so let's, the, the way that we accomplish this big thing of the novel is um, for me, I don't think of, I don't sit down every day thinking I'm writing a novel today. And I really don't think <laughs> that you should either because it can become really daunting. Yes, you're writing a novel, but that's the big project. So in novel in five, we write 4,000 words per week, which is about give or take 16,000 words per month. And so if you begin the first week of 2021, you will have 16,000 words by the end of January, 32,000 by the end of February, you see the math adding up. And by the end of May, you have 80,000 words. And actually we take the last two weeks of May to talk about revision and publishing. So, um, but by the end, you have about 80, 74 to 80,000 words of a manuscript that then you can work with to um, revise before you send it out. Um, and if we go on to the next slide and the next one, that's just the um, cover. Let me tell you what um, you get in novel in five. So you get a new video and written lesson twice a week. So you actually get more than 80 video written and written lessons on craft process and some that are just sort of to motivate you to keep going. Um, you get a new assignment twice a week and the assignments are designed to help you write a new scene, chapter, character, to introduce a complication, to introduce an antagonist. It's very progressive um, assignments to help you get a piece of your novel on the page every week. Um, and remember how we talked about accountability? I actually check in with you twice a month on your word count and you have to put it up there on, um, you put it in our, um, in our, uh, group discussion, your word count for the lot, you know, for the, your cumulative word count that you are at at that point. And I find that students love this because when you're thinking you have to share your word count with someone, um, and that person is me and your classmates, <laughs> it makes you feel like that you get that little warm, fuzzy, tough love feeling. And I think that um, is really helpful. So that's um, sort of the basics of how the class works. And I'm happy to answer questions if we have any now, but I'll also talk a little bit, um, if there are no questions yet, about how the class came to be and that sort of thing. So, so one, one thing, thing before we hop into the, the first, first question, question. With, with, with Smith, Smith, Smith. Smith. Uh, the link to the course is actually in the, the YouTube description. So for anyone who is interested in checking out Michelle's course, if you registered for the workshop, we'll send out a link as well. But if you wanted to check out Michelle's workshop, uh, sorry, Michelle's class, uh, writing a novel in five, uh, it actually has a special discount from aware for, for I think $50 off. And you can get that link right in the YouTube course description. Yeah. Um, with that, Michelle, we do have one question, which I think is is okay. timely. Um, I'm actually going to bring it up on the screen for you. This is from Sean. Uh, any tips on embedding sensory details in a way that feels natural and doesn't bore the reader? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Sean. Yes. Um, so I always say don't start with the moon. <laughs> and this means that if you look out the window and you have a full moon, that looks beautiful, of course. and the first thing you want to do is write about it, but don't. Um, the reader has seen the full moon before. So yes, you want sensory details. You want taste, smell, touch, um, hearing, taste, smell, touch, sound, um, sight. Um, so you want the sensory details in your story, but you have to choose significant details. So uh, the there's a sofa in in the room 
Uh, so you're describing a room. There's a sofa. We don't need to know that the sofa is plaid or paisley. We don't need to know that it's corduroy. Um, in fact, we only need to know details about that sofa if it somehow is in the story, like a baby was made on that sofa or, you know, like something um, or Elvis sat on that sofa. Um, so you bring in sensory details, but you you pick and choose. And I was, you know, when you're writing, you can put as many as you want. And then when you're editing, pare it down. Two adjectives um, for one object is enough. It's um, a red silicone phone case is a lot of is enough adjectives you probably don't need to say that there's a red silicone phone case at all but if for some reason you want to you wouldn't say red silicone phone case uh beat up phone case because you've added an a third extra that's not important so i always say write them all and then strip away most of the adjectives and almost all of the adverbs Th thank you for that, Michelle. Uh, and that, if you don't mind, a few more questions, and then we can hop yeah. back more into yeah. this. this. Related to your course was, uh, O. Scrub asks, what do the office hours look like? So office hours are usually on Wednesday at 11 um, a.m. Pacific time, which is where I am. And office hours, I am here by video, so students can jump in and just ask me. So you don't have to make an appointment. You just jump onto the Zoom link and you can ask me your questions. That's what office hours are. It's like, uh, you remember um, in the old days in college where you like never wanted to go to your office, <laughs> to the professor's office hours. Yeah. Um, this hopefully is the opposite of that because it's just a way for you to pick my brain. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, another question, if you don't mind, is if we base our uh, settings on where we live, does it help to create our own versions of the setting in terms of adding new buildings or history? Okay, that's it. Thank you for that question, Simi. Um, well, it really depends. So now if you base your um, setting on a real place, let's say San Francisco, and you have the fly fishing ponds um, in Golden Gate Park, and you have the bison, um, somebody's going to know if the bison are not where they're supposed to be, <laughs> you know, like if you, or someone's going to know if you put the Bashful Bowl 2 restaurant there now, and it closed in 2019. So um, you, when you're basing in a real place, you always think about how um, true you want to be to the specifics of the place because um, there are people who are going to notice that and you just decide how comfortable you are with uh, if, if you're going to get emails of people saying, no, this wasn't there on that day or whatever. But um, you can create, um, yes, you can um, create a history of an event that happened in that place, of course, that didn't actually happen. Um, you can, I, the I'll give you an, ex this is just the first example that pops to my mind. I wrote a novel set in modern day San Francisco on the day when California is voting on whether or not to secede from the United States. So the, all of the setting is real um, and down to the Veterans Administration Hospital on, um, I think it's 42nd and uh, California's um, out in the avenues in the outer Richmond. But the events that are happening that day are completely fictional, even though it's in modern day. So you can add history, you can add any events you want. Um, and yes, it's also okay to add a building if that's if that's important to you. If there's if something needs to be there that doesn't exist, you can. But if you're using street names, I'm just gonna <laughs> gonna tell you because I have um, in my in my early days I was not as detail oriented, and and people and now everybody has their maps on their phone and they will tell you if you get a street name wrong or a corner like if this intersection is wrong they'll let you know so it's just up to you how 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 much um how much you want to hew to the reality of that place thank you for that michelle uh, a few more questions about your course and then it, you're good yeah, on time right if we go yeah. a minute or two extra cool cool because we'll try to get to as many of these as we could um 
a blunt button important question. Uh, the cost of your course, because I, I don't think I, I named that. I want to say it's four forty nine off the top of my head with the the discount. Yes. So I think that's in the final slide, but I'll I'll let you know now. Yes, that's a great question. Of course, an important one. So this class is normally four ninety nine, but through Teachable, it is four. 49. So yes, it's a $50 discount. And there is something else kind of big that you get through this link um, from from the Discover um, workshop is that um, you also get a 10 page critique of um, you can be the first chapter of your novel or any part in your novel you want um, at some point during the course, whenever you choose to submit it sometime after the first month, you may choose to submit at the end. You may choose to submit it day 32. It's really up to you. But um, this 10 page critique is um, I do developmental editing. You find it on my teachable website and I charge $199 for that. But if you enroll through this link, um, you get that um, for free. <laughs> um, this is pretty big. <laughs> I, I could be. We, we appreciate you offering that. Right on that at some yeah. point, but um, I actually love reading student work, but um, it's not built into novel and five because just the time it takes is enormous. But that is something that you get with this uh, with this class through Discover. Thank you, Michelle. Actually, yeah. and, I, and I'm sorry that question just for for calling it out. That was from I didn't pull it on the screen, but that was from Ian. Oh, thank um, you. Ian. Now, so another question related to that, just about your course in particular, is I want to bring it up here from Geraldine. Um, you know, first off, Geraldine, congratulations on having ninety-eight thousand words. Um, but you know, if they have ninety-eight thousand words and no end in sight, challenge focused on uh, weaving the multi-generational characters and sculpting down to eighty thousand words to tell that story. You know, being in that situation, is this something a course like yours might be helpful with? Like, do you have any recommendations or things you would offer up to this uh, creator? Yeah, Geraldine, thank you for this question. I love this because yes, we haven't even talked about that. And um, is, can you do a novel in progress in this class? In other words, can you, you, you've already written a big chunk of your draft. Is this course still helpful to you? And the answer is yes. So a lot of, um, so this novel in five actually came out of a course that I started in 2019 called Novel in Nine, where students wrote 2,000 to 2,500 words a week for nine months. And I got responses from, you know, people love this class, but I got responses from other people said, I think I would like to see results more quickly than nine months. <laughs> Can you condense it? And that's how, um, how Novel in Five came about was condensing this popular course for people who had a little more time to spend on their writing. And a lot of the writers I have gotten in Novel in Nine are writers who do have a draft that they've been working on for a long time and they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And especially with a book like yours, where it's multi-generational, you have a lot of characters, you have a lot of moving parts, the it's sometimes it gets too big to manage. And this happens to writers who are writing their first novel. It happens to writers who are writing their sixth novel. So I know where you're coming from because I've grappled with this a lot myself. So yes, um, I you will get really helpful information of how to sort of weave this information together. And one of the lessons that I think is the most helpful in the course is about using screenwriting principles to, um, and to reverse engineer a novel that has already been written, to reverse engineer a draft and get it in a better shape that has more urgency and more clarity. So short answer, yes. I would I would love to have you in the class. And I think you would get a lot out of it, Geraldine. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I think we had, if it's cool with you, do you have time for one yeah, more? Of course. One more question? Wonderful. So we have a question from Jill, which is, could you say more about how you proceed with your writing when you don't know your ending? Um, do you keep filling out the index cards with ideas and quotes and, and hope it leads you someplace? Can you speak a bit to that, Michelle? Yeah, thank you, Jill. So I um, actually, I don't use index cards, uh, physical index cards, although, um, as you know, from, uh, from this um, time we've spent here together, um, that's how Nabokov worked. I do um, 
use, I use Scrivener. And so I have digital index cards <laughs> across the board. But the way I work when I don't know the ending, one thing I didn't tell you that I do know is the time frame. So we talked about setting being place and time, but for me, that's also time frame. So I know if a novel is going to take place in one day, which I've done that. I know if it's going to take place in one year. I know if it's going to um, take place in about eight months or two years. So I have that sort of framework in my mind. And as I'm working, I always know the big question. So your novel begins with a very big question that has to be answered by the end. And as you create progressive complications, as you get your characters in more trouble, there will be um, new questions that have to be answered, new problems that have to be solved, but you're always going to have this question from the beginning of the book that you have to answer at the end of the book. So I always have in sight that I'm going to have to answer, will the marriage stay together? If that's the book, will they escape this cult? Will the girl be found? So the sort of dominoes that I'm setting up are all leading toward um, coming to an answer for that, even if I don't know exactly what the answer will be. And yes, um, your novel does lead you someplace. And I think um, what is helpful about novel in five is it doesn't lead you off into the wilderness. Um, it gives you time to think about the process of discovery of the book, but you have a cap. You know, in the first and second weeks of May, you're actually writing the end of the book. Now, that doesn't mean that the end isn't going to change. You might decide as you're revising that you know a better ending, but you know that you're going to write the, the last chapter um, in weeks one and two of May. <laughs> so there is an end in sight for the process. Thank you, Jill. Thank you so much for that, Michelle. Um, before we, because we, we are kind of at time, uh, everyone who joined us today, you know, let's give Michelle a round of applause in the chat. Thank you so much. Because I mean, there, there, you covered so much ground in an hour and, and I, I appreciate that. This was not just informative, but it gave me a lot to think about, e even how I approach writing beyond just for novels. So for all of us who are, who are still with us watching this chat or watching it in the, the replay, you know, please let Michelle know you appreciate her in the chat because I really appreciate you making the time to be with us here today on Discover. Um, Thank you, Aaron. Of course, of course. With that, I do want to give you the opportunity. I know we didn't get to all the questions. I'm sorry, folks, but we are at time. Michelle, did you have any last words, any parting knowledge you wanted to share with the group who've joined us today? Um, well, I guess I just want to, um, I want to tell you that you can write your novel this year, that it's a dream that a lot of people have, and it's not impossible. You can do it. I can tell you there's a learning curve. You probably need some guidance. You probably need some accountability. Um, and so, um, I would love to see you in class and in the slides, I have a few testimonials, but you'll see that if you go onto the course page too, I think, um uh yeah so um so the testimonials are from students who went through novel in five because again now i've i who went through novel in nine because now novel in five is the compressed versions for students who want to write faster but um my favorite testimonial i ever got for this class was a student named polly who has a popular blog who wrote novel in nine was much more than a class for me it was a transformation i tried for years and years to write a novel always unsuccessfully under michelle's guidance i was able to complete my first novel in a seamless uncomplicated manageable workflow so um that meant the world to me you'll find more testimonials like this when you visit the website um what I found teaching this class is that people come to it because they want to write a novel and it's sort of this unfinished business in their life. And then they finish that novel and it goes beyond writing a book, the sense of accomplishment you have when you finally finish that novel. And also just sort of the sense that you do have the right to write a novel. You have the right to take that time. Um, for yourself and for your creative life and take the time to do that and sort of do something you've always wanted to do. So I just uh, want to encourage you. Those are my parting words. Um, I'd love to see you in class because 
um, you deserve to write the novel that you want to write, and I'd love to help you do that. Well, Michelle, thank you again. We're going to sign off here in just a few moments. Thank you for everyone who joined us all over the world. I know that, yeah, y'all are the best, um, especially the, the, I know some of the people who joined us, the, you know, all, other, all the way on the other side of the world where it's nighttime, wherever you are, good morning, good evening, good night. We appreciate you. With that, we'll be signing off. Thank you again, Michelle. Okay, take care, Aaron. Bye, okay, bye-bye. Stay on, Michelle.